in early April of 1731, there was this British brig called the Rebecca. She began to sail away from Jamaica, fully loaded with sugar, molasses, gin, coffee, and various Caribbean commodities. Its captain, Robert Jenkins, who's at the helm, and he's looking forward to an uneventful trip and a big fat paycheck when he gets back to England. Now, the Rebecca was a merchant ship. She once was a brigantine or a warship, but she had been converted, and she had been sold to the Royal African Company. Thus, Jenkins made the bulk of his money in the transportation of human cargo. Yes, the Rebecca was a slave ship. But once its human cargo was delivered, Captain Jenkins was free to purchase a new cargo for the last leg of the Triangle of Trade from the colonies to the New World to the safe shores of England. And in fact, that's what he did in Jamaica. But as the Rebecca sailed past the Spanish possession of Cuba, a Spanish sloop called the La Isabella appeared on the horizon. Its captain was Julio Leon Fandino, and he was a proud member of the Spanish Coast Guard, and he took serious his charge, rid the Spanish possessions of smugglers, and also rid the area around Cuba of pirates, and protect the coast of Cuba and defend Spanish interests against illegal trade. Fully loaded, Jenkins could not outsail the much smaller and quicker La Isabella. And besides, thought Jenkins, Britain and Spain had recently signed a treaty, the Treaty of Seville, which was signed in 1729, and that ended a very short war between their two nations, the Anglo-Spanish War, 1727 to 1729. And that treaty, along with an earlier treaty, reinstated the rights of Asiento to sailors like Jenkins. Asiento was a Spanish agreement that allowed slave traders not of Spanish origin to deliver shipment to Spanish colonies in the New World, especially to its Caribbean colonies such as Cuba. Now, Jenkins pulled his sails slowed down, he raised a welcome flag. Fandino, ambitious perhaps, nonetheless fired cannon shot at the Rebecca until Jenkins gave the order to drop anchor. Fandino climbed aboard the Rebecca with a small contingent of Spanish Marines. Jenkins encouraged Fandino to talk in his cabin, but In less than five minutes, two Spanish Marines appeared at the door. They had just finished inspecting the holds of the Rebecca, and they reported to Fandino that there was some Spanish uh, contraband aboard the Rebecca. Fandino flew into a rage, pulled his sword, and ordered his Marines to seize Jenkins. Fandino had the English captain tied to the main mast of the Rebecca, where he promptly, in front of all the sailors, sliced off the ear of Captain Jenkins. Fandino then threw the ear to the deck and was said to have exclaimed in perfect English, Give this ear to your king as a warning. Spain will not tolerate smugglers. The Marines then ordered Jenkins' crew to assist in transferring almost half of its cargo to the La Isabella, and the confrontation was soon over. It took up until June of 1731 for Jenkins and the Rebecca to finally pull into the safe confines of London. The incident received little notice. There was a small blurb in Gentleman's Magazine, that was it. 
After several months, Jenkins was given an audience to the Prime Minister at the time, Sir Robert Walpole. Jenkins showed his ear to the Prime Minister within a box. But Walpole attempted to steer England clear of war. Tensions were rising in Europe over colonial possessions and trading rights, and Walpole knew that England was ill-prepared to fight, the treasury account was too low, and the number of allies that Britain could count upon in case of war was at an all-time low. So Walpole stalled for a time. The War of Jenkins' Ear finally does break out, but not until 1739, eight years after the fact. The war, allegedly fought over an ear, would not end until 1748. But dropping back for a moment, and looking at the larger, more grand narrative of history, one must pay attention to the war not over the loss of an ear, but because this war, like Queen Anne's war a couple of decades prior, had been fought over mercantile trade and not religion. The War of Jenkins' Ear pointed to wars being fought by European powers over who possessed what in the New World and who could ostensibly trade in the New World. Remember, it was a Dutch trading ship that dropped the first African slaves in colonial Virginia in 1619. And this is a tremendous shift. Religious wars decimated Europe for centuries. That wars in the 18th century were now being fought over trade, it certainly needs a closer look. It's a shift. But I'll also try to address another trend unto which the War of Jenkins' Ear pointed to, and that's the trend called smuggling. Smuggling. The one very startling flaw in the mercantile system. All European nations did their best to curtail illicit trade. And this was one reason Captain Julio Leon Fandino was sailing the La Isabella on that April in 1731 to prevent smugglers from infringing upon Spanish trade. And recently, though, historians have become curious over smuggling and have turned their attentions to the practice, in part because a number of finds in the waters of the Caribbean have turned up vessels unaccounted for, unnamed, and nonetheless laden with goods of just about everything, from rum and sugar, but also fine porcelain from as far away as China. And according to historian Evan T. Jones, with an essay, Illicit Business, accounting for smuggling in mid-16th century Bristol, smuggling was bigger, more organized, and benefiting a richer sort of clientele than recently imagined. In the two decades of the 1530s and the 1540s, the merchant elite of Bristol, a port city in the southwest of England, quote, the amount of crown money lost to smuggling would have exceeded the customs revenue actually collected in the port. So it's not surprising then, with the exportation of settlers to the New World, so did smuggling go. So wars during the 18th century were now being fought over territory over trade, over future ideals of wealth. Meanwhile, as nation-states scrambled and tussled to protect their overseas domains, their very own merchants, their own people, 
were smuggling. What did this mean for the colonies of Britain, especially those along the eastern seaboard of North America? What did mercantilism and smuggling mean to them? And further, what products were monopolized at the direction of the state, and who was doing their best to operate outside of this mercantile system? Among historians, mercantilism holds numerous definitions. There isn't any one agreed-upon meaning. That's probably because mercantilism never looked the same from one country that claimed to practice it to the next nation-state that also claimed it was doing the same thing. The fact of the matter is that not every country employed the economic principles of mercantilism, and for those that did, they tended to tweak it to fit their liking. But there are some basic similarities. One, the goal was to have more gold and silver bullion in the treasury than was going out. For that to occur, the state needed to adopt trading policies whereby the country exported more than it imported, at least in terms of valuations. Two, to make that happen, the state awarded monopolies to just one corporation over one particular region and then usually concerning one or two particular commodities. So, for example, the Virginia Company was given a charter by the state, King James of England, 1606, one of our primary documents. And the Virginia Company was the only company that could operate and bring back to England, according to that charter, gold and silver for the treasury. Okay, okay, so there's no gold or silver in Virginia, which is why a second charter was issued in 1616. And the second corporate entity, known as the Virginia Company, now had the responsibility of sending to England just one commodity, tobacco. In England, that tobacco would be converted into all sorts of products. Snuff, cigars, cigarettes, pipe tobacco, medicine, really, medicine. Uh, not only for consumption within England, but then ready for export overseas. But where? Where could English tobacco be sold? Notice it's no longer Virginia tobacco. <laughs> Virginia only sent the raw materials. This tobacco itself, you know, tobacco itself is useless unless someone does something with it. Unless That's what gives tobacco its true value. That's what can be sold, and that in turn is what will fill up the British vaults with more gold and silver coming in than going out. Fortunately for England, it has a whole host of places where its manufactured tobacco is in demand. Yeah, it's called the Empire. Three, these trading monopolies, however, needed a certain amount of protection. Now, the state sometimes overlapped monopolies, creating two or three companies that participated in a particular region, but the state often did this only to foster efficiency or to argue that one company sought a commodity not covered by another. Further, what was to prevent a foreign ship from sailing into a colonial harbor to sell its goods? States, therefore, had to invest in arms, a large navy or more men on the ground, to defend trading rights and enforce monopolies. Now, mercantilism would work if all of this went perfectly. But you know how life is. Sometimes there are complications. So take, for example, the simple premise of supplying England with tobacco. To supply the state with tobacco, the Virginia Company had to grow it. To grow tobacco, the Virginia Company would have to clear land 
and reclaim swamps. Well, to clear land and reclaim swamps and then plant and harvest the tobacco, the Virginia Company needed people. Lots and lots of people. Which is why the second charter of Virginia used the head right system to its maximum. But according to historian Peter Colchin, in his book Unfree Labor, American Slavery and Russian Serfdom, a la 1987, a shortage of laborers plagued the Virginia Company and the progenitor class. Land was plentiful. Labor scarce. Now, we have this Gabriel Thomas primary document for this week, Pennsylvania, the Poor Man's Paradise, and it shows just how scarce labor was in the colonies. Skilled artisans in Philadelphia were making three times as much in salary than they could earn in London. But Colchin demonstrates in his book that high salaries were not enough. Not enough people were attracted to that. Further, Colchin says that companies and corporations caught in the mercantile system also grew impatient. And because of labor shortages, some colonies actually attempted to enslave Indians. That South Carolina had 1,400 Indian slaves in its books in the year 1708. That New Jersey or the wills and probates coming out of New Jersey revealed also a small number of Indian slaves well into the mid 18th century. And further that it was not until 1712 that the state of or the colony of Massachusetts forbade the practice of enslaving Indians. Still the most common form of forced labor uh, throughout the 17th and early 18th century were indentured servants. As kind as the headright system was to some very wealthy landowners, not all colonies participated in the headright system. In either case though, knowledge that your investment, your payment to bring over a servant from England, Wales, or Scotland, well, those payments lasted only five to seven years and then your investment is free to walk away. Still, Colchin argued that England was slow on the uptake to import African slaves. For Colchin, the time it took for England to switch from white indentured servants to black slaves was, quote, most striking. Only until 1680 did colonies and companies begin to make payments for a permanent and enslaved workforce. But, Colchin argues, that that particular system, the importation of black slaves, doesn't really firm up completely until about 1730. Why? Well, first there was the cost. Few could afford to buy slaves, which were about twice as expensive as white indentured servants. Second, at least indentured servants could speak the language. And they knew how to farm. African slaves often knew neither. Colchin argues that in between 1680 and 1730, most of the slaves that arrived in colonial Virginia did not come from Africa they came from the Caribbean. These slaves cost more, but they were, quote, already seasoned. In other words, these slaves have been working the cane fields of Barbados or Jamaica or any of the other British holdings in the Caribbean, and therefore they already knew some rudimentary English, and they had learned some rudimentary farm skills eh, to some degree. And they also proved, most importantly, resistant to malaria and yellow fever, a predominant problem in the swamps of the eastern seaboard. Additionally, Colchin states that the English were relative latecomers to the slave trade itself. 
Now, if you recall, we had a secondary document uh, from Edmund Morgan and an excerpt from his book, American Slavery, American Freedom. And he began his story about slavery in colonial America off the coast of Panama in the 1530s, some 70 years before a colony would even be landed in what is now the United States. Morgan did this mostly to show how the English pirates, John Hawkins and Francis Drake, used runaway slaves and their Indian allies hiding in the hills of Panama to attack Spanish towns. In other words, Morgan wanted you to know that slavery, as a system of trade, as under the mercantilist policies, were already normalized part of the world's economic system some seven decades prior to English settlements on the east coast of North America. Only after England had prevailed in the Anglo-Dutch War of 1664 to 1667 did England's navy become large enough to protect a global mercantile fleet. This is why, explains Peter Colchin, there is no charter given to any company to trade in African slaves until the creation of the Royal African Company in the year 1672. But the Royal African Company struggled, both to make a profit and to supply the labor-hungry regions of the British Caribbean and British North America with the manpower it needed to supply England with the raw materials it needed to manufacture the finished products it needed to sell a growing empire in order to make mercantilism work. Whew. By 1698, English plantation owners in North America, along with the freeholders in the Caribbean, both of the progenitor class, well, they'd lost their patience. They vigorously attacked the Royal African Company's monopoly in London, while resorting to raising and outfitting their own slave ships. In other words, the rich progenitor class of North America and the Caribbean islands began to smuggle. And they smuggled, of all things, human beings. They sailed for Africa, and they returned with slaves. They bypassed totally the mercantile system altogether. African slaves were now being imported legally and illegally into the Caribbean and the swamps of Virginia and the Carolinas. Now for any of you who have read or have come to know the story of Robinson Crusoe, an English novel printed in the year 1711 by Daniel Defoe, it is on one of these private missions on a private ship that set out to gather African slaves for plantations in Brazil outside of the mercantile system, outside of the law. What Crusoe was planning to do, and let's be blunt, was to smuggle black people across the ocean for a lifetime of forced and unfree labor. That's when he crashed and became a solitary figure on a deserted island. Now getting back to Peter Colchin, he is going to supply us with some numbers, and he attempts to set out what those numbers mean. So here I have this graph. Now first of all, what this graph tells us are the number of legal head rights distributed every five years beginning in 1650 and ending in 1700. The key term is legal. The number of head rights granted to a plantation owner or someone who paid for the passage of a white servant is shown in brown. The number of head rights given based on the importation of an African slave is shown in blue. Now there's this huge dip in the importation of white servants that takes place in the time period 1675 to 1679. Reminder, Bacon's Rebellion occurs in 1676. And this is 
one of the keys that helps us understand this chart. After Bacon's Rebellion, the importation of white settlers from Britain never again rises to the level prior to the rebellion. Not even close. But the rise in legal African unfree labor imports, at least through the headright system, remained painstakingly slow. So slow that only 1,043 African slaves are imported into Virginia over the last five years of the 17th century. Now we began this lecture with the story of a British merchant captain, Robert Jenkins, who lost an ear because a Spanish captain had discovered a small amount of illegal Spanish contraband aboard his vessel, the Rebecca. England would go to war with Spain eventually. But eventually it will be the war between Great Britain and France, the First World War, according to Winston Churchill, that will capture our attention. The battleground of the French and Indian War will be everywhere, from India to Europe to the Caribbean to colonial North America. But lest we not forget, while wars came and went to defend mercantile rights, smuggling, ladies and gentlemen, it never ceased. Till next time.